feel true. So um, I will just say that this is, this is my first experiment as a virtual field trip leader. Um, and as I went through trying to figure out how I was actually going to do this and how it was different from a talk, I, uh, I have inserted some videos to this. Um, you'll see that I'm pretty much a novice. Um, that's all I'll say for right now. Um, we will go ahead and have um, a break about halfway through so you can uh, get coffee or pay coffee rental or whatever you need to do. Give me a chance to, I'm going to try to watch the chat as we go along. Um, and if you have comments and questions, put them in there and, and I'll take some pauses and try to um, answer on the fly. And then at the break, we could answer more questions. Um, I guess I was going to tell you I had 500 slides and I cut it down to about 45. So I think we'll be able to go through this in um, an hour and a half with, with questions, discussions, whatever in the break. So if Debbie, if you, if you don't mind, I, I would like to um, start sharing my screen. Sure, you've got ultimate power right now. Okay, and if everybody would um, use the chat box, that would be um, probably best um, to keep things sane while we're going through this. Okay, let's see. This is my vacation here. Okay. 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 Um, well, thanks everybody for showing up on a Saturday morning. Um, when I thought about giving this trip early this year, <laughs> I had no idea, of course, what was going to happen. And I even thought, well, wow, I could actually have given this trip. Um, with 20 some odd people. But then as things have turned out, um, I guess I'm glad we're trying to do, we're doing this virtually as it, as it all turned out. Um, I want to tell you, I've been writing a book uh, with my co-author, Paul Hazeman, who's on this call. And um, we've been working on this for two years. The book is called Golden Rocks, The Geology and Mining History of Gold in Colorado. And this field trip is, um, is a, a bit of a preview of parts of the book. Um, on, on the right hand side of your screen, I have another book that Bill Ross referred me to early this year. Um, and I, I, I think it's a great title because this book is actually not written just for a geologist. It's actually written for an audience that's broader than geologists. Um, we started out with maybe high school students, but realized probably the complexity of the subject matter was if somebody's interested in science as a lay person, this, this is really the kind of the target audience. And I read this book, it's a great title, If I Understood You, Would I Have This Look on My Face? And um, I don't know if you know, Alan Alda has gotten into science communication um, in the last 20 years and has a rather well respect, respected foundation um, back in New York that talks about this. So as I go through this talk, um, it may not be the depth of what you would look for as a scientist, but I will actually have a place where I pose the questions. How would you explain this to a non-geology audience? So kind of just as a, go, as, a, as a thought process as I go through this. So what we're going to do on our trip today, what I would do in the field is that stop one, I would basically set up the stratigraphic column for you. So we'll do that and walk through time a little bit. Then we'll make three stops. Um, um, one, we'll go through the west side of town, the east side of town, and then end up in the middle. And that, those three stops kind of preview all the geology, um, the major geologic features in Golden. Part of what makes Golden so, so unique is the fact it has these uh, three kind of general areas in town that we'll go through. So here's my first video. So um, this is a shot for some of you who aren't maybe in the Denver area. This is the Denver metropolitan area um, on the right hand side of the screen. And then um, you can see the large urbanization. And then we get on the left hand side of the screen, we're in the upland uh, of the front range. And Golden's right at this, this boundary where the Great Plains meet the Rockies. 
So we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, zoom in. I'm trying, I tried not to do this so you got air sick or anything. We'll just kind of zoom in to Golden slowly. I may stop this. Like right, oops, wrong place. Oops, oh, I already screwed this up. Okay, let's try this again. Zooming in is Golden, North and South Table Mountain, Green Mountain. The Golden Valley is kind of between Table Mountains and the whole front range, where you can see, and we have a little ground roll in there. Um, and then we zoom into the Golden Valley, kind of stop, and this is the geologic map superimposed on the topography draped over the Google Earth topography. And so what we're going to do is talk about talk about um, the west side of town, the east side of town, and the Table Mountains, and then how the whole Golden Valley came to be. And we're going to make three stops within this. Stop one is on the west side of town, where the um, on the major structural part of what's called the Golden Fault System, where these fault lines are, where I'm running my cursor. Stop. Actually, stop three is going to stop two. It's, it's labeled stop three here. Is going to be over on South Table Mountain, and looking at volcanic rocks and um, volcanogenic sediments. And then the last stop is a, a, a park down on Clear Creek, where we'll talk about the um, a little bit about the mining history of Golden and the um, the evolution of the Golden Valley and the Quaternary mostly. So let's start with a walk through time. Um, I'll be referring to the stratigraphic column that I have here on the right hand side of the screen. Some of you will, will re recognize that the, um, the um, very far right side of the column is Bob Weimer's um, and Leroy's column that I've actually cleaned up. And then I've put the geologic color bars that'll correspond to the geologic map colors of the USGS on the left side um, with times. Many of these ages are have a tilde in front, which indicates some approximation of some of these times because they're not very well dated. And that kind of shows you the, the time from the Precambrian up to the Quaternary. We have a, about, excluding the Precambrian, we have about 300 million years of, of time and um, unconformity time in Golden. And we'll just kind of walk through that uh, bit by bit here. So we'll start with um, the Precambrian Nice, which is 1.7 billion years old. And then on top of that, we have the fountain formation. This is a real, this is, this is what you see at Red Rocks, but these are outcrops that are all in golden. Um, the one on the top shows the Nice. If you look at my white arrow, you see the Nice foliation is running from left to right. And then the fountain is right on top of that contact in a really nice irregular contact. And the fountain is actually dipping uh, down to the right here at, a, at about uh, 50 degrees angle. So this is, this is, to me, this is a very nice example of the unconformity. Many people call it the great unconformity because of the amount of time represented there with um, the approximate age of the basal fountain, very poorly known. I just said it was around 312 million years. That could be a little old. And maybe it's, maybe it's like um, more like 300. There's just no age control on that. But you can see there's a definite large amount of time represented in that contact. And that is <clears throat> that time, the, ang the angular unconformity here, well, disconformity. Um, is basically representing the uplift of the ancestral Rocky Mountains in the, um, in the Pennsylvania time. Um, again, the sediments here are conglomeratic sandstone and conglomerate itself, um, kind of sheet-like braided uh, river deposits, um, interbatted with red overbank mudstones, which you can see in the bottom photo really well. This is at the um, former Heritage Square site. I got permission from Martin Marietta to come in here and take these photos. And um, this, I call this a geologically manicured outcrop. It was part of the Heritage Square development. And the, um, the sandstones are the light red, and then the overbank mudstones are these dark reds. You can see some really nice, as my cursor traces out, some nice scour features. Bedding is up to the left and it's tilted about 35 to 40 degrees to the east here. 
Um, anyway, so the story goes that um, this was called Big, Ra Big Rock Candy Mountain in the Heritage Square development. And they were gonna put a castle on top of this. So they scraped the top off and they you know, manicured the outcrop really well. Well, the castle never got built. The, it just never happened, but it did make a nice outcrop. So that's called locally the Big Rock Candy Mountain outcrop, just so you know that. Um, in terms of the strat column over here on the left, um, the black box will show you the um, interval we're looking at in the pictures. And then at the bottom, I'll always have an annotation. If there was some kind of mining um, in some of these units, I have it annotated. And in this case, um, the Precambrian gneiss has been mined for aggregate in Golden from about 1900 to the present. And we'll, we'll talk about that at our last stop a little bit. But um, it's a very important commodity, has a really long history. I'll just say that um, a couple weeks ago, I gave a talk on the mining history of Golden for. Um, Barb Warden's online um, Ollie class at, at, through DU. And I did an hour plot just on the mining history of gold. And so we're gonna just really hardly touch on this, just to kind of bring it out as that exists. So if we go up to the next part of the stratigraphic column, we have the Lion Sandstone, which is Permian. And I think we all know that in the Denver area is a, a Aeolian deposit that we use for building stone. But in Golden, it's actually, the outcrops in Golden are dominated by, um, especially down in South Golden where I live, a very coarse grained uh, fluvial channel filling succession. Shown here on the top is this kind of bulbous outcrop. It actually has a really low relief scoured base. And then the fill is in the lower picture here. We have, for my finger for scale, we have pretty large class. They're usually um, quartz and or um, granite just like you see in the, um, the uh, fountain, but, but this is actually up in the lions. A lot of little pink feldspar um, granule and, and small pebble class. It's really a coarse, very coarse deposit. Um, and in fact, Aeolian facies in the golden area are rare. There's, there's basically no outcrops that are known and part of that's a function of outcrop quality. But even down in Morrison, they're, they're not as common. There's only one wedge at, toward the upper part of the, um, the lion sandstone there. So we have some nice outcrops, but they're a different depositional environment than you might expect. Going up now in the column from that, we have the lichens formation, which is um, per, late Permian and, and may contain the tri permo-triassic boundary in it. Um, very shallow, restricted marine deposits, no macrofossils. Microfossils are also rare to lacking. It may contain the, uh, the Permo-Triassic boundary extinction event. Um, it's not obvious. James Hagedorn has tried to find it here and not been successful. And in any case, there's no change across in the depositional environment across that boundary. So there's no lithologic change that would tell you that extinction event happened. And uh, that's an interesting issue that's actually a worldwide feature um, of that, that extinction event. It doesn't have, you know, for a sedimentary geologist like me, as um, one of my colleagues would say, it breaks my heart that there's no depositional change across that boundary. It just, it's an event, it happened, and the depositional environment did not care one bit what happened when 90% uh, of life got wiped out across that boundary. Um, one of the interesting things in um, the area in Golden, we have some limestone members in the basal part of the lichens. On the top, here's a, a nice outcrop over in the North Golden by the city shops. And you have um, the lion's contact on the left, and then a really nice section of lichens, the falcon member, limestone, more lichen shale, the glennon member, which is the biggest, the thickest part, and then more lichens on top. The Permo-Triassic boundary would probably be off to the uh, right-hand side of this photo. But these limestones are actually microbialites. And the picture down in the, um, the lower center here shows the laminations with a pencil for scale. They're really, really fine, nice laminations, crinkly. Apparently the heads, there were algal heads in here that were maybe a foot or two, you know, less than a meter high. Um, and when Ferdinand Hayden came to Golden in 1869, when he started to map in the Rockies, he called this the bastard limestone. 
And, you know, I've, I've been uh, trying to figure out exactly why he said that. And there's really probably two reasons. One is it's got a lot of sand in the limestone. So maybe it's just not the most pure limestone in the world. That could be one reason. But the other reason could be is when you look at the whole section of sedimentary rocks and golden, limestone's kind of an odd thing. It's like, so maybe he decided it was such an oddity that in the terms of the time, and you know, this was the 1860s, he called it the bastard limestone, which has been very amusing to a lot of people when I've told them this story, that the bastard limestone. And, you know, of course, we had to rename it something else. So now it's called the Glennon limestone member. So it's kind of an interesting story. So walking up again, up through the section above the, the, the lichens and probably above the Permo-Triassic boundary, we have a fairly major hiatus um, to the base of the Morrison or, or the Ralston Creek is the base of Morrison's called in this area. Um, probably about 150 million years of hiatus. So that's a, that's a fair chunk of time. But then we get to probably the best, one of, one of the best known sections in the Front Range, um, which is the Morrison Lytle Dakota, um, deposited from about 157 to 100 million years ago. Um, and we pretty much know this from the I-70 road cut. It's been studied, I think, if you live in the Denver area or you've traveled through here as a geologist, you may have walked on these uh, road cuts. And in the bottom, I have a panorama showing the Basil Morrison slash Ralston Creek, the Lytle Formation, and then what's called the South Platte Formation, which we would just call the Dakota. It's got the, um, the Plain View, Skull Creek, um, and then the um, Dakota, um, the J sand basically on top of that, which we're really familiar with in the Denver Basin. Um, here, at, here at the I-70 road cut, the dips are running around 35 degrees, but as you come north in Golden, that changes dramatically as we'll talk about at stop one. Um, the Dakota and Morrison are really well known for their dinosaur bones um, and tracks in the Dakota especially. And I think every sedimentology class has gone out to Dinosaur Ridge and, and it's all over golden outcrops too and seen the ama in re really amazing wave ripples in the Dakota as shown here on the upper, the upper photo with these beautiful um, even wave, wave ripples on these almost vertically dipping beds. The other thing that's pretty cool about the Dakota and Golden, which you may not know about, is that there's some amazing fossil tracks. Um, there's bird tracks that are rarest, some of the rarest in the world. Um, there's crocodile swim marks, which I have in the upper corner. These little funny claw, these are just claw marks as the crocodiles, uh, the cast, the bottom of the bed, it came through a channel and probably scraped the bottom of the bed. And those are like the toenail claw marks. There's quite a lot of those, um, both on the north and south end of Golden in the Dakota. So there's a lot to see. It's all right in our little town, all compact. So we'll go on up to the next next part, which is the, um, <laughs> it's the, it's basically a marine shale section that represents about 30 million years of time. It's the, the Granero, Maori Graneros, Greenhorn, Niobrara, and most of the Pierre. Um, and they don't outcrop in Golden because they're cut out along the Golden Fault System. We'll talk about that more at um, stop one but that's like 8,800 feet a section that's cut out. And that was uh, very confusing to the early geologists, like uh, when they came to, Ge to Golden, including Hayden and his, and, um, and his assistant, um, Archibald Marvine, in the 1870, early 1870s. It's like, where did this stuff go? Why is it not here? Um, so anyway, we aren't gonna talk about that. It's, it's kind of heartbreaking if you're in the unconventional petroleum place because uh, we all know the Maori, Graneros, and Greenhorn and Niobrara are, are, are some of those plays, but we'll, we'll kind of skip over that because we don't have uh, outcrops to talk about. So we do have amazing outcrops of the um, Upper Pierre, Fox Hills, and Laramie. Um, and that's one of the things that Bob Weimer has talked about for years. It's one of the best expressions of um, the Laramie Formation and its associated uh, reason for being there, which is the Laramide orogeny. 
but we, we have really good outcrops of the uh, Fox Hills, and that's in the bottom photo here with the arrow. This is on the Mines campus at, I think this is stop six on the Weimer Trail. This is a nice outcrop of Fox Hills sandstone. On the right is the older pier. Notice that the sediments here are dipping off to the west. Uh-oh, the dog's gonna bark. No, don't do that. Um, and anyway, it's overturned section. And we'll talk, we are gonna talk about this specific outcrop here, but this is part of this, um, the structure along the Golden Fault system that we'll touch on at stop one. But anyway, coursing upward kind of succession to kind of a strand line sandstone that sometimes has a lot of fossil clams in it. And this is the Fox Hills. Above the Fox Hills in the photo on the top, you see some uh, thin sandstone beds. These are little um, kind of crevasse splays interbedded with some white and red banded clay and then more sandstone beds. This is part of the Laramie Formation overlaying the Fox Hills strand line. And it's a really large deltaic complex. And um, it is highly famous for fossil tracks, which I've shown here as some of the Triceratops tracks. Uh, plants are abundant. There's palm fronds, all sorts of uh, amazing plants in here. And this was about the time of 70 to 69 million years between the Fox Hills to the top of the Laramie. Get a little more of that at stop two. Um, the Laramie is, um, because of its deltaic depositional environment, had some fairly major coal seams in it. And coal was mined from the 1860s to about 1940. The heyday was in uh, the late 1800s. And brick clay mining, I forgot to mention the Dakota was another clay mining thing. Um, but Laramie brick clay, uh, most of the buildings at School of Mines are made of brick clay from the Laramie and bricks made in Golden. Most of the Denver Federal Center brick buildings are brick clay from Golden and bricks made in Golden. And the heyday of that went a long time, 1870 to 2001 in Golden. And there's still an active um, Laramie clay mine right down on the uh, West Flank Green Mountain off Alameda Parkway. There's actually two, a North and South mine that are being worked right now. So it's a, been a long lived uh, mining history for the Laramie Formation. Going up to the next unit that I really like is, um, it's actually called a formation, but it really is just a kind of a mappable bed. It's the Arapahoe Conglomerate, which lies directly on the um, Laramie Formation deltaic deposits, which is a fairly major shift in depositional environment over a pretty short amount of geologic time, maybe less than a million years. Um, there's chert class that are common in here, vein quartz, granitic class, volcanic porphyries, really a huge change in provenance from anything that was going on below it. And that actually represents the rise of the um, Laramide Rockies to the west, but far to the west, because these porphyries that um, are coming into this particular deposit are probably sourced from volcanoes over near the Fraser area, a fairly, um, a fairly, you know, long ways away. So the rock, the Rockies hadn't risen in Golden at this point, but Golden was receiving the detritus as the ri rising mountain range uplifted and there was kind of an unroofing sequence. So basically that's what these conglomerates represent is the really arrival of the Laramide orogeny um, in the Rockies. And Bob Reynolds put this at the base of the D1 Denver se sequence, which I think is uh, tr truly appropriate. So it's a it's pretty neat, it's a, also an endangered outcrop species in Golden. It used to be on the mines campus, the Weimer Trail, but that got uh, covered up by a parking garage in the last year and a half. And this outcrop I have here on the lower right with the arrow, um, that's actually on the Fossil Trace Golf Course. It's probably the best outcrop remaining in the city. The other one is um, off US 6 over by um, Earth Treks uh, in that outcrop along the highway, which is, um, again, it, the structure there is pretty interesting. It's kind of overturned. This is almost, uh, this is vertical, near vertical. Um, but that's a not harder outcrop to get on. And I don't know if you get stopped by the highway patrol or not. Um, the way you get on this outcrop is to sneak on during the winter or at night 
<laughs> so it's still kind of an endangered species of outcrop. So we'll go on to the next one, which is Green Mountain formation. Oh, sorry, the big one, Denver formation, called so the most of the D1 sequence of Reynolds. Um, it has sedimentary volcanogenic sandstones interbedded with uh, basalts, which form the caps and part of the, the North and Sable, sort of South Table Mountain. Um, we'll talk about this more, but the, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is also um, within the Denver Formation. We'll talk about that at stop two. I show some dates on this um, from North Table Mountain. Um, the basalt flows there have been recently um, redated by Millikan et al. Um, 2018, and they have some pretty precise dates, but uh, we'll talk about later the, the, pr the accuracy. Um, one of the problems with the dates is they make sense until you get to the youngest flow, and then the youngest flow looks older than the stuff below it, so it's one of those accuracy issues. But generally, Flow one, um, if you go up to North Table Mountain to go mountain biking or hiking on the west side trailhead, you see this view. Um, flow one, it, the, the bench there is 66.5, and three and four are around 65. So you don't, if you want to project where the um, KT boundary is, it's at 66 million years. So you can guess it's somewhere in the slopes between that middle flow one, middle slope, flow one and then the cap rock flows. Um, the other thing about the basalt flows, and this is a big deal for open spaces, we'll talk later, is the basalt was, is, makes excellent aggregate. It's not reactive. Um, and it was mined uh, for aggregate from about 1900 to 1975. And there's a lot of aggregate pits still left up there too, mines and um, quarries basically. The basalt itself is a potassium rich basalt called Shoshonite. And um, in the picture below, you can see all the black specks in there are augite. So it's kind of a more basic kind of rock. So now I just want to say um, the lava flows themselves, I mean, from the time Hayden and all his fellows came to gold and to present, it's been pretty obvious that the lava flows, and there's four successions as per um, Dravis, who remapped it in 2008. Um, it's pretty obviously they came from Ralston Dyke. And some people say, well, it's postulated, but you know, I just say it happened. It's pretty easy to figure out. This is a picture at the top showing where Ralston Dyke is, and I put my own little cartoon. I don't think it was exactly a big volcano. It was maybe more like a vent. Um, and that's the place that's now an aggregate quarry uh, right near Ralston Creek on Highway 93 between Golden and Boulder. So anyway, the, the age dates, the compositions, all pretty much point toward that being the vent or the volcanic center that the flows came out. And they came out and spread around from north to south. Um, flow three is the longest. It goes all the way to the north side of Green Mountain. You can find the outcrops there. So I made a cartoon at the bottom right here that maybe this is what Golden looked like around 65 million years ago. The mountain fright, I think, ran right along Illinois Street, not where it is today, because today it's an erosional feature. But the actual active front was on, on the mines campus. And then the flows came down and kind of nestled along the mountain front to, from north to south. I don't know where they went on the east edge, but um, then they kind of, the farthest they went to the south was about down to Green Mountain. So it's a distance of say eight to 10 miles to, from north to south. So anyway, just some thoughts about that. Then we go to the Green Mountain Formation, which is a poorly, not too precisely dated. I just give it around 64 million years. It's, it's younger than the Denver form, than the basalts on Table Mountain. It's about 600 to 800 feet thick above Lava Flow 3. So it gives you kind of an idea uh, about its age and, and thickness. Um, it's also dominated by conglomerate. Um, the CGS has called it an alluvial fan deposit. Um, 
there is actually an un angular unconformity between the Denver Formation and the Green Mountain Formation on the west side of Green Mountain. So if you ever go into that open space area, you can uh, check out these outcrops and see channel deposits that are at 30 degree dips to the east and then above the unconformity they're at 10. So it's, a, it's subtle, but it's actually quite visible from some of the trails on the west side. Um, the class in the conglomerates are uh, very dominated by volcanic porphyries, quartzite and granite. And so again, it's been called another one of these unroofing successions as the um, Laramide mountains kind of renewed and the uplift uh, started going again. Um, it never really stopped, but perhaps there's episodes of where it's more dominant sometimes than others. So then we're going to skip to after about a 50 to 34 million year hiatus, the last next sedimentary deposits in Golden are Quaternary Alluvium. And um, the interest, it's an interesting story. I know some of you have, have studied the degradation of the Rockies from uh, Miocene to present. That's a story that uh, is really interesting to try to figure out. Um, and most of the landscape in Golden that's happened in the last 30 million years anyway is a degradational thing. It's not, it's not, preserve, it's not adding sedimentary deposit, it's taking them away. We'll talk about that more at stop three, but there are several ages and types of quaternary surfaces in Golden and associated alluvial deposits. Um, the one at the top there in the middle is along Highway 58. That's probably what's called the Broadway alluvium, which is roughly 30 to 13,000 years old. So it's a um, late Pinedale glaciation deposit. Um, and then, of course, I have to talk about the armory. And some of you know that is where Caf Cafe 13 is. And I'll just say right now, it's like it may have 50,000 year old alluvial co cobbles in that. And we'll talk about that a little more at stop three. So I'll leave that for uh, next. Um, and also just to remind you that the gravels of all ages have been the source of plaster gold mining. That's actually what started the Pikes Peak gold rush um, in 1859 down on Cherry Creek. It moved up Clear Creek and is into Golden, the alluvium across, along Clear Creek, these quaternary gravels. And then sand and gravel mining has been really common just east of Golden from 1920 to about the 1980s before urbanization basically covered up all the gravel pits. So uh, that's another interesting story. And one of the things that made sand and gravel really worthwhile is they had an extra catcher to get the gold flakes out of it. So they sometimes might have made more money actually from the placer gold as a adjunct to sand and gravel mining, ironically. So anyway, enough for that. Um, so I've kind of alluded to, you know, kind of four domains, topographic domains in Golden. This is the USGS geologic map by Kellogg et al. that I've used uh, as a shape file, and then the Leroy and Weimer column on the right side keyed to the colors. All the colors uh, mean the same thing. So we have the mountain front on the east, west, sorry, which is the Precambrian Nice, about 1.7 billion years old in this area. Then we have the west side of town. And the west side of town is um, pretty much the section from the Pennsylvania to the upper Cretaceous. And it's all pretty vertically dipping. Um, and that's basically a function of the Golden Fault System, which is the, um, this line I'm tracing with my cursor, it kind of comes down and here's where we'll go to stop one and we'll actually go right on this fault. And it follows down and all, goes all the way down um, past the uh, Green Mountain, down the valley there. Um, cuts out the Benton, Niobrara, Pierre Shale, about 8,800 8, feet of section along this fault. So you go basically, we'll, we'll see you go from um, Dakota and older straight into Laramie and Fox Hills, which is a, a missing a whole lot of section. Um, then the east side of town is pretty flat. It's like three to five degree dips. Um, and it's basically South Table Mountain. This kind of brown color are the volcanic flows outlining South Table Mountain. And then North Table Mountain also outlined by volcanic flows that are the 66 and a half to 65 
kind of age range. That's all interbedded with Denver formation. Um, and then the last domain, and we'll do this at stop three, is we'll talk about Clear Creek, because it's pretty obvious Clear Creek flows straight across all the topography. It's kind of a classic um, superimposed stream kind of geometry. And that's, that's characteristic, and we'll talk about its possible history of the last 600,000 years, years, and then the degradational landscape formed in the last 34 million years. So that's kind of the story of the Clear Creek, the Quaternary. So we'll, we'll kind of start at stop one on the west side structure, stop two, the Denver formation and the volcanic flows, the KPG boundary, and then three to the Quaternary and some of the mining history. So uh, let's see, what do we got on time here? So what I want to do is we'll go, we'll do stop one, and that's basically structure. And then what we'll do is we'll take a five minute break after that. So I'll just give you um, a chance to think about that. Okay, let's go to the west side of Golden and look at the Golden Fault System. So just to repeat, the same map. So the west side of Golden, we have the Golden Fault. We have steep tilts. And the tilts here are, um, sometimes they're overturned like um, mostly it's like 85 degree dips, 80, 85s, but sometimes you'll get the uh, 75 or 70 degree dip overturned to mostly to the west. Um, and then on, and that's kind of a dash where that dip changes is this dash line that some investigators have called a fault. And I see no reason it has to be a fault. It certainly could be a very sharp fold as Ned Stern has postulated, and I agree with him. But I think what that really tells you is that's where the mountain front was. Because basically everything west of this fault is vertical, and everything right across that boundary, literally across the street at mines, it's like five degrees. So you go from 90 to five across that line. And to me, that, that says that's where the mountain front was at some point in the, the Laramide. It involves the lower Denver formation and all the older sediments. So it kind of brackets, at least the full timing is somewhere around 67, 67 to 66 million years. Interesting, I've also shown the first geologic map of Golden on the right hand side here by Archibald Marvine, who has a real interesting story as a geologist. He was a he, he was a 25-year-old field assistant to Hayden, and his territory encompassed 5,000 square miles of northeastern Colorado when he came out here. So that's a fairly large area. And he, among other things, made the first geologic map of Golden, showing here on the right, this is out of the archives of the Library of Congress, which you can download for free. And uh, he shows this, this feature this curving in at Golden, here's North Table Mountain, South Table Mountain, Green Mountains down here on the very south end. And you know, the, the, there were no topo maps, so he was making, he had a topographer with him, they were making their own. You can kind of see Clear Creek, it looks pretty good. But um, basically you see the line, this line curving in right toward the mountain front at Golden, and then really cutting off all the hogback ridges to on the north side and then all these hogback stripes on the south side and you see the fault coming in almost to the mountain front although he did not know it was a fault he postulated it could be a fault but for about 50 years a lot of people just thought it was kind of an onlapping unconformity and they they had known about onlapping unconformities and they thought this just onlapped this feature here, onlapped here, onlapped here. So this was like a mountain. And these strata were just onlapping it. And it took about till about 1900 for people to finally realize this was a fault. And that this, these were actually upthrown on the west side and everything on the east side was downthrown. And, and it's interesting to me that Golden, 
of all the places along the front range has been a place where this fault has puzzled people for a long, long time. And it, and it continues today, and that we'll talk about that at the very end of the, this stop. But uh, I thought our first geologic map was kind of cool to look at and to think about, yeah, so people are just trying to observe what's, what's on the ground, basic mapping, we see these things cut off, makes this sinuous pattern, and huh, that's real interesting. Also, it's fair to say that in the 1870s, if you look at what's going on in other parts of the world, like the Alps and Scotland, the Highlands of Scotland, there was huge controversies over faults, and especially thrust faults, where you had older over younger. Um, if you ever look into the history of um, Scottish geology and, and the history of the Alps, it took a long time for people to realize there were these thrust faults. And I think fair enough to say that if you ever go to the Alps and look at the naps there, um, it's kind of obvious that that's what they have to be. And that was probably a really big key for people to understand thrust faults and take that somewhere else in the world and apply it there. So just kind of an interesting way thought evolves in our science. So um, here comes stop one, another great video. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna fly in, this, we're looking north here. You can see stop one is in the middle, two will go over to Castle Rock, and then three is on the north side of town uh, along Clear Creek. And as we go in, I'll try to uh, narrate the, um, the geology as we fly into this. So this big ridge here is the Dakota hogback, and you can see it ends. This red sediment right in here is the Lichens formation, which is Permo-Triassic. The Morrison is this white sandstone going up to here, um, to the right. This is all pretty much vertically dipping. We'll have a better map. And we're going to fly into, you can see kind of a disturbed area, a linear feature here, and then another one here. We're going to fly into this area and look at um, some old trenches. I'll talk about what you do with those. And you can just kind of look at this going, huh, well, let's go back to here. Here's the ridge we just flew over flying in here, this ridge is totally gone. So on that early geologic map, everybody goes, oh, the ridge is gone. It doesn't come back till North Golden. That's, that's to me the easiest way to understand how this fault is, is changing the geologic features in here. It basically comes across the east side of the hogback and swings across the mine survey field, almost gets to the mountain front here and then swings back and comes back out here where the North Hog back is uh, still intact. So if we um, look at this area from two views, I just kind of showed you this one on the right. Here's the Dakota Hog back overturned uh, to the west about 80 degrees. Um, the outcrops here, this is actually near my house. We would have come to my house, had coffee, and then walked through this if we could do it in person. Uh, we would have looked at these dips 70 to 80 degrees overturned. The lichens is also about 80 overturned. It's all kind of the same dip domain. And then you have a, a flat surface here, which is one of these quaternary surfaces called the Verdo surface. The fault doesn't cut that, and the trench was dug in the alluvium, the old alluvium, down into bedrock, which is this circle. Kind of Turning around and looking now to the south, there was that Dakota hogback. It's cut out here by the fault. Um, the fault's dotted across the surface because it doesn't cut that. There's no outcrops in here. I've rooted around. Um, it's just lousy outcrop. And, but there should be the golden fault in here. And one of the problems with the golden fault is it just doesn't have very good um, exposures that you can see anything in. So. What happened in the um, in 1979, actually the late 70s, you may have heard that Rocky Flats used to be a plutonium manufacturing facility to make um, triggers for nuclear bombs. Very controversial, but it was there for a long time. And as people started to understand active faulting, a question came up about was the Golden Fault a young fault? And what happened was um, enough controversy was generated and there was a lot of good questions about it. And so there was a program in 1979 that DO, DOE um, 
basically paid a consultant, Dames and Moore, who's a pretty well-known geotechnical firm, to come out and trench the, the Golden Fault in several locations. And one of these is right down here, where this ellipse is. And the trench was, um, I'll show you the trench logs next. So it's kind of in the area of the ellipse. Um, the guy who mapped the Golden Quad helped him pick the spot. Bill, um, well, both Bill Cobbin came out to look at fossils. Glenn Scott came out to make sure they got it in the right place. So that, you know, where he had mapped it. So they, they did find it, and I'll show you the trench logs. Um, but anyway, it's kind of interesting. Here's kind of how the geology sets up. Um, and basically, there's a little parallax, but the Dakota gets completely cut out here, and then you basically have Morrison next to Pierre Shale. And I'll just preview the dips they found in the trench um, in the Pierre Shale were overturned about 80 very consistent with everything else. And then the dips in the um, Morrison, also consistent, 72 to 80. Um, so very consistent with the dips. Oh, this one's reversed, sorry, that's a boo-boo. Um, they're, so they're basically near vertical and slightly overturned to the west. Okay, so now we'll look at a trench log. If you've ever looked at these, it takes you a while to kind of figure them out. So let me walk you through this. So this is the trench log from the Dames and Moore report. Um, scale, each one of these ticks up here is one meter. Same with the vertical, one meter. So the depth of the trench is about one, two, three, four, five meters deep. Um, all these little funny lines in here, they had to put shoring in here. So all of these are the shoring um, posts so the trench doesn't cave in on you. I used to do this for a living, so when I started out, so I, I, I appreciate what happens in, in digging trenches. And uh, they had to put two sets of shoring in here, which is, um, it's just fun to deal with those. You need a bunch of people to lug them around and make them work. But anyway, then what you do is wherever you go and you basically make a very, very detailed map of the alluvial units, the bedrocks, you get as many, uh, dips and strikes of everything you can get. And um, you usually present it, this would be the um, very, very far east side. And then you go up the hill uh, and the fault was actually encountered right in here. We'll look at that more in the next slide. Um, and then the, this end comes back to here and you basically go up the hill again to the, the whole trench. So it was a pretty long trench. Um, just to make sure they um, they logged both sides of the trench in the main trench, and then they dug a subsidiary trench about 40 feet to the south to look at another view of the Golden Fault. So, you know, they tried to make, you try to make your own outcrop, and then you try to figure out the cross-cutting relationships in the trench, and is the alluvium offset? That's the big question for understanding the activity uh, level of the, of the fault itself in question. But they have a lot of nice, you know, taking a lot of dips and strikes. Again, the Pierre bedding was overturned to the west, consistent with what outcrops you could see. Same in the Morrison. So basically, um, that was very consistent with the outcropping at the surface. So let's go look at this fault, uh, a little more of an enlargement. And again, it's you've got to kind of key your eye into this. Um, so basically, I didn't color this, but they found Pierre with Morrison faulted on top of it. And here's one of the fault lines dipping um, north 55, striking north 55 west, dipping 43 west. So it's a bit, it's quite a bit steeper than the bedding. Um, the fault dips were ranging. This was about the steepest fault dip they got. This one was actually uh, very low, about 15 degrees low fault, again, Morrison on top of Pierre. And then, you know, the critical thing is mapping all these different kind of alluvial units and then correlating those across the trench. And one of the other things they do in this is they gauge the age. If they don't find any um, carbon datable material, and they didn't expect to because the alluvial surface here is quite old, way past radiocarbon um, dating, 
they basically do soil profiles and based on the textural maturity of the soils, there's a whole uh, science about this, they can pretty much guess based on regional information, the age of the alluvium. And this is part of those veritas alluvial deposits that are, you know, in the greater than 200,000 years old um, kind of age range. So this doesn't meet anybody's criteria for an active fault. Um, but it is in the USGS Quaternary Fault Database, I think is a class two type fault because there was question about it, but it's definitely not likely an active fault. But uh, one of the cool things is you look at some of the, the, here's the Morrison and it's got this funny, you know, like it's going over the top of alluvium. And you know, you've got to realize that there's soil creep processes going on. You're looking at a very old surface. Um, and we'll get down to the quaternary probability as of what this was like. This is a very, very old erosional degradational surface that probably had soil creep on it. So you have, sometimes you can find, um, let's see, find burrows like this one could have even been um, a little bit of an animal burrow. Um, they call them crota, crota venas or something. And anyway, it's an animal burrow, like a, like a, um, uh, like a hedgehog would burrow into the dirt or something like that. But anyway, it's, I thought it was interesting because it's, it's, it's data. It's a little bit ambiguous sometimes when you look at the trench logs, but it's actually the only place you can see the Golden Fault, period. I mean, you can't find it without digging a trench, basically. So this is, a, this is one of those things. It's like, it looks to me like it's a, it dips, highest is 43, the lowest is 15. So it's definitely dipping west. It's putting Morrison on top of Pierre. The dips in the surrounding bedrocks are really similar, so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting picture. It's a low angle fault, um, dividing pretty high angle high angle dipping buds. So just data that you probably have never seen before. Kind of interesting stuff. So let's go to the interpretation of the Golden Fault, and as Ned calls it, the Golden Fault system is probably a much better way to think about it, and the Golden Fault itself is one of the faults in that system. And so if we go back to Marvine's 1874, the first cross-section in Golden, um, you know, figuring, he, he actually had the guts to project some of these, this would be the, the fountain formation. Um, I'm not sure exactly where he drew this line. It's a little obscure, but the fountain does dip, um, you know, 45 to 50. Then when you get over to the lichens and the, um, the lions, you actually start getting subvertical to slightly overturned buds, which he shows here. And then over here, this is the Laramie. It's got coal in it. This is all overturned to the west. And then you have Table Mountain on the east side, and it's flattish. We'll say it's three to five degree dips. So it's like, okay, well, you know, what were you going to do in 1874 to figure this out? He knew there's dips that are opposing each other. He didn't draw the faults in. It was not something that was easy to interpret at that time, given what people understood about faults. So he speculated in his text that there was a fault there. But, you know, as it turned out, the actual acceptance of there being a fault in here somewhere didn't really happen till about 1900 or so. And then all the interpretations since then, and this, this one in the lower left is Bob Weimer's approximate 2010 um, picture of the Golden Fault System in Marcus Hall at Colorado School of Mines. It's kind of been, well, somehow you have to uplift the basement over the flatter lying sediments of the Denver Basin. And how you do that in Golden um, is usually envisioned as something fairly straightforward as maybe a fault or two uplifting the Precambrian over the basement as shown here. And the Laramide Mountain Front or the Basin Edge as Bob called it, he, he thinks it's a fault here. That's Illinois Street because the dips change from vertical to flat. Um, it's also easily a very kinky fold it's also not just the basin edge, it's the Laramide mountain front of 
66 million years ago, my interpretation. Um, now I'm gonna make a plug for Ned because I think he needs to run another field trip. The last time he did a field trip was May of 2014. He interprets, he's reinterpreted this as a, um, with what I'll just call a triangle zone concept where you have multiple faults, multiple dip directions, you have an evolving system through time with wedges, little triangle wedges. And um, this is his most recent cross-section series that's balanced and restored. Um, and basically, here's the succession before, after, around 66 million years. And what I did here was draw in the current ground surface for reference. But when you balance it, you get a big, a big wedge of sediment that goes over the mountains, which you have to have. And you have a very complex zone down here in the golden area. Uh, the inset enlargement is here. Um, and as, as you can see, it's something you have to sit and look at a long time to understand. And what he's done is he's taken all the old mine data from theses, um, he's gone out and walked on the outcrops, tried to resolve all the dip directions, done a huge amount of work to come up with interpretation like this. Um, and then I have a picture of him from 2014 trying to explain triangle zone mechanics using a styrofoam wedge and something we used to call a phone book, which I don't think exists anymore. So I just will put a plug in and say it's definitely time for another field trip. Um, and hopefully he's, he's made comments, I don't know if he's on this call or not, but he's made comments to the fact he'd like to run another trip. So let's just keep, keep that in mind. But then just to, before we take a break, I have a question of science communication because I've, I've talked to people, I've walked them through um, down where I showed you the trench, the, where the Dakota hogback cuts, gets cut off. And one of the hardest things a non-geologist had is understanding what a fault is. And if you think back to your own education, I would say, you know, one of the hardest classes we maybe took when we were undergrads was structural geology. So it was not, we may have loved it, but it was, you know, it was very challenging. Some people more challenging than others, and it's one of the harder classes. So, the question of science communication is how would you explain any of this to someone who doesn't understand what a fault is? And I will just let you mull that over. And at this point, um, again, you know, Alan Alda's title, you know, if I understood what you said, why am I looking at you like this? Um, and triangle zones are probably right up there with um, something I wouldn't try to explain to a non-geologist. So just some food for thought for you. So with that, I was gonna go ahead and um, take a break here for five minutes. It's 10.36. Um, we may go a little longer than 11, but you guys can hang with me, I hope. Um, we have two more stops. They're both fun stops. And uh, why don't we resume at um, 1040, take a four minute break. So um, we'll just kind of stop for a second. Thanks, Donna. So I'll just answer some of the question here. Uh, let's see. Oh, have I seen the Rocky Flat seismic data? Yes, that was, that's Ned's. He's actually reprocessed that, he's got a recent reprocessing of that that shows beautiful triangles on geometry, which sets up why this is um, a reasonable interpretation. So, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's pretty neat. That's why he needs to run another field trip. What's the reasoning behind the coarse grain facies and chimney gulch? considered lions. Oh, okay, that was actually, <coughs> so the, um, the coarse grain facies I showed you as lions, that is, um, that is in the upper part of the lions above the fountain. It's a stratigraphic reasoning. And it's basically mostly the lions is white colored dominantly, 
and the fountain is red and basically you can kind of see where the contact is along Kinney Run Gulch and the, that, that coarse grain lion's facies is way above anything you would consider fountain. So it's stratigraphic relationships that it's called lions. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Chimney Gulch, so Clark, um, Chimney Gulch, if you go up Chimney Gulch Trail, you won't see lions because it's, it's where that is, it's basically fountain next to pier across the, the Golden Fall. So you won't pick up the lions again until you get into the survey field and the fault's kind of um, curved out to the east and the hanging wall contains the lions in it. And there is lions on the survey field, but it's not very well exposed. Um, but the best lions is down up, down on Kinney Run bike trail. Um, that would be, that would be in South Golden. <coughs> and we just had Kristen Shorey um, um, do a drone image across that outcrop. I haven't seen it yet, but I was kind of hoping to do some architecture work on it. Okay, let's see. Yeah, but that outcrop of the, um, the fountain lions, the fountain, Nice contact is in is right on Chimney Gulch Trail, right below the the road to that old house that house on the side. If you've ever been up there, and it's just you just drop over the side, you go, oh my gosh, that's the best outcrop I've ever seen. It's pretty cool. It's right in our backyard. Yep. Oh, did anyone pursue overhang oil and gas plays along the Rocky Mountain front? Um, yes, there's actually a history of that, Rob. And um, so Ned Stern drilled a well up by Rocky Flats that was testing some of his triangle zone concept. And I'll leave that to him to tell us about on a field trip. And then in the 50s, which kind of set up, was really nice data. There was two wells drilled down near Soda Lakes along um, Bear Creek, just north of south of Bear Creek that's, that drilled through the fault zone, had shows in the Niobrara, and actually produced some oil for a while. Um, so they were at least commercial for a while in the 50s, but then they were ultimately abandoned. And that had some really interesting uh, fault geometry in it that Ned's again incorporated to his, um, into his models interpretation. Yeah. I think urbanization, as I'll talk about in the mining history, has probably um, made that play not too reasonable anymore, to just put it mildly. Uh, oh, the, the, palm, the palm frond in the Laramie, you can see that on Triceratops Trail um, by the Fossil Trace Golf Course. That's a neat trail. It's, I really recommend everybody to walk along it. It's pretty cool. They got the first probable, let's see, Allosaurus? T -rex. It's a T-Rex footprint, possible. First one in the world there. Um, yeah, pretty cool. How are we doing? Oh, we're gonna resume. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about palm fronds. <laughs> okay, let's talk about going to the next stop. Okay, so from stop one, we're going to fly across the Golden Valley to stop two, fly and go across the golf course and go over to um, the west side of South Table Mountain in an area where you can go hiking. This is called the Lubon Trail here. Let's see, go. Okay, so a better view, kind of zooming out. You can park here, uh, there's a trailhead, there's a new county open space trail that uh, doesn't show up on this Google Earth image. Um, you can go right up to the base of the flows and the view in the amphitheater here of Castle Rock is really supreme. Um, I've dashed in the approximate location of the KPG boundary. Um, again, it is approximate, 
but it is here and it's never been exploited to figure it out. Um, probably because right now um, you couldn't get permission to do that, but it's definitely toward the base of the uh, switchbacks on the Lubon Trail. So we'll talk about this KPG boundary. Um, <laughs> the KPG boundary in North America was first described on South Table Mountain in the late 1930s. Um, it was because there was a faunal, uh, a, a plant, a botanical change and a faunal change across it. Um, it, as you all really know this story, uh, 66 million years ago, this has been rather accurately and precisely dated now, an asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, courtesy of Camp Cam Cat Campbell, who with me went over to North Table Mountain and played with dinosaurs um, in the summer, we have, a, we have a rendition of what that might have looked like when the asteroid hit with a, a T-Rex and a, um, well, this is a brontosaurus, so maybe that's the wrong age fossil. But we, we, we were playing with fossils, and I probably, sh uh, well, playing with, I shouldn't tell you this. I, we did it. Um, so anyway, this is a picture on the upper right with uh, Kirk Johnson and Bob Weimer's in here. We took a, a group trip out to the KPG boundary, which is now part of the Cretaceous and Tertiary Trails on the southeast side of South Table Mountain. You can go to the South Crop really easy. This is where it was first described for a, a change in the, the fauna. Um, also, it was pretty obvious there was a change in the, um, the plants. So on the lower part of South Table Mountain, um, Arthur Lakes and actually one of his students found a T-Rex tooth. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then above you would find all sorts of uh, mammals. Um, so basically, also as I said earlier, um, because of the more recent age dates that are, are more precise and a lot more accurate, although still some issues, over on North Table Mountain, the um, KAPG boundary is somewhere between lava flow one and then lava flows three and four, which are the main cap rocks. So um, it's kind of cool. It's like, I've told people that around Golden, they're like, gosh, you know, that's pretty neat. Golden was kind of famous and it's all on North and South Table Mountain over here. The problem on, on the, uh, of actually not finding it with the, um, the iridium zone, et cetera, it's unfortunately depositional environments kind of a, a channel succession came through and probably eroded out the actual iridium later here, but there's no reason if you couldn't dig around, and again, getting permission to do this would be uh, almost impossible. You might be able to find it other places on the mountain if you can get permission to get a backhoe out there. And I'm not advocating that, I'm just saying that it could happen. Um, so if we went up to the Lubon Trail, we get a great close-up of Castle Rock. Um, you could see the distinction between flows three and four. You would see that there's actually an irregular base to flow three. Um, Dravis, when he remapped this, uh, felt that the flows were actually flowing down river channels, which makes sense. Um, it, they do actually cut across the sedimentary bedding, which I've shown here in uh, blue-green dashed lines. And this, so this would be the Denver formation. It doesn't, it tends to cov get covered with a really thick colluvial clay layer, but it is, it is sandy and it is, it's, there's a lot of silt and clay in it. Um, also interesting, this was a favorite area of Arthur Lakes to come collecting plant fossils right in this amphitheater, right in where these beds are. And this is an, a, picture, another picture of a palm tree uh, found up in this area in the 1880s from the Yale Peabody Museum. And then as I also said, um, there was a T-Rex tooth found below the projection of the KPG boundary um, in 1874 by an Arthur Lake student and they went out collecting. Um, and the story about this is, is it got stuck in the Peabody Museum basement until it was rediscovered in around 19 around 2000, 1999 by Ken Carpenter, when Arthur Lakes became, you know, a really interesting person in all his work around Dinosaur Ridge. Ken Carpenter, then at the Museum of Nature and Science, went to the Yale Peabody Museum and found this thing stuck in the basement 
um, at where I'd been stuck in 1874. And it was actually the very first T-Rex tooth found in North America. So I guess the moral of that story is clean out your basin some, sometimes, you know, makes a, it helps out. So these are all part of the Denver formation, the D1 sequence. Um, another thing we could see up on the, this area is a really cool um, channel lens. Um, these are kind of rare, but they're very conglomerate conglomeratic. The class are um, very much volcanic. They're, they're porphyritic, but they are not the same basalt as the lava flows. They're, qu they're quite different. They're also more andesitic. And uh, they probably came also from volcanoes near Fraser, Colorado. So again, you were getting this, you had eroded the mountains enough to erode them down and be having transport of those materials across the front range uplift to Golden. And then at the bottom, I just kind of show you the overview of this channel. Um, interesting architecture, very suggestive to me, a very flashy discharge. Um, I wouldn't even really call this braided. It's, it's just pretty, um, maybe even just upper flow regime um, bed forms maybe some debris flows. But anyway, it's something you can walk up to and see, and we could have done that um, in person. Very volcanogenic, very uh, poorly sorted. So Golden 66 million years ago um, was likely right at the foot of the uplifting Rockies. Probably there were a lot of earthquakes. It was at sea level still, periodically covered by lava flows coming from Ralston Dyke. It was mostly a subtropical to tropical rainforest as the vegetation shows. And it really got fried. And if you've ever seen the new, we were going to have a field trip to the Corral Bluffs um, discovery area that um, the Denver Museum folks have been working on. But we'll have to do that next year to talk to see, see what the impact did botanically to, um, to, the, to the fauna and the flora. Um, it pretty much erased everything, burned it to a crisp. Bottom line is, although to a geologist it would have been pretty cool, not so much if you were a homeowner. Not a good time to live here. So let's go on to our, our next stop, which is about Clear Creek Canyon to a place called New Loveland Park. We'll hit a little bit of the mining heritage and then talk about the quaternary geology. Just to start this though, I thought it'd be neat to show you guys, this is a blurry photo, but I love it. So this is from the Denver Public Library Western History Collection online photos. It's a rich resource to find all sorts of neat stuff. And this was taken in 1885, so it's golden. Here's a South Table Mountain and Castle Rock, North Table Mountain. Um, the foreground area is now the Weimer Trail and the former clay pits where there's a parking lot and an athletic field. You see a little disturbance in this ground. They were doing a little bit of clay mining here, pretty minimal. There's a coal mine here, the white ash mine with this tailings pile. This is now uh, the soccer field at the mines. There's a brick factory right down here on the baseball diamond. And what I really like about this picture is the smoke, because there's like four smelters over here. And I don't think we appreciate that Golden in the 1880s actually had the nickname of Little Pittsburgh because it was a mining and industry town. There was coal being mined locally here, at, like at the White Ash Mine. And then it was feeding these smelters, which were pumping out all sorts of smoke, which in those times was considered a really cool thing because it meant progress. Um, I don't know what the people thought living down here, but, but that was a good thing in 1885. Um, there was a pottery manufacturing, there was a paper mill. It was kind of a little industrial town that was capturing metals coming out of the mountains to process with a rail line back out to Denver. Um, so it was, it was quite a different spot than we think of right now as, as our little town. So let's go to New Loveland Park. We're down here, we're gonna fly over to a park. It's right at the mouth of Clear Creek. Very lovely park. And here's where we're gonna talk about a little more on the mining history and the quaternary geology. This is where we would have had our lunch stop if we had done this as an in-person trip. 
So here's New Loveland Park. Here's what it looked like in 1890. It was a coal mine. And the name of the coal mine was the New Loveland Mine. Um, there was a railroad track spur going at the base of the slope, which is now taken up by Highway 58. These black patches in here were an abandoned coal mine called the Old Loveland Coal Mine, which had a very infamous history um, that caused the death of 10 miners across the creek in the White Ash Mine in 1889. Different, another time, another talk. Um, basically, the Old Loveland Coal Mine was just about where Highway 58 is and my cursor kind of right down in here where the 8th Street Avenue uh, apartments are. So it was a different place in the 1800s. It was a mining town of, of industrial minerals in a lot of ways. So I've, a part of my, part of our book, we've um, mapped all the locations that we could find of former mines in and around Golden, shown in this diagram um, on the geologic map. With the, with the commodities I mentioned, there's basalt and bedrock nice, that was for aggregate crushed stone. Um, gravel pits for um, sand and gravel and the quaternary alluvium. And you'll notice that the coal and clay mines are all lined up in a north-south line. That follows the geology. The pink, hot pink, are outcrops of the Laramie Formation, and that's where the coal mine was. Coal mines seams were in the Laramie, that deltaic unit. The clay mines were also in the same thing. But these were brick clays more than, than, so brick clay was made for brick, but also things like sewer pipe, which was, you know, kind of one of those humble commodities that, you know, when the 1900s hit and people realized that their drinking water was bad and causing typhoid and all sorts of nasty diseases, everybody wanted to put sewers in. And what'd you need for sewers? Clay. The other clay, was on the Dakota Hogback, which I forgot to mention earlier, and that was a really high quality um, kaolinite clay, very pure alumina clay that would withstand very high firing temperatures and had um, supported a thriving pottery in industry in the 1870s um, and up through the 1900s. So the, the short story of that is that that clay became super important for two reasons. Um, it helped establish a company we now know as Coors Tech for two reasons, war and alcohol. In, in 1914, the state of Colorado passed a law saying prohibition was going to start in Colorado in 1916. He gave it to two year warning. It was earlier than the rest of the United States. At that point, Joseph Coors, who had started to dabble in the clay industry, realized he had a big problem because he was running this thing called a brewery, which wasn't going to run anymore. So he knew he had to diversify. He got very involved with another gentleman who had a pottery company and eventually bought him out because in 1916, then Prohibition started and World War I started in Europe. At that point, um, Germany was supplying all the um, fire clay products, porcelain products to the United States. And the US government put an embargo on it, which meant, uh-oh, we need that. So they put out a request for a proposal basically to all the US companies, 17 responded, to become a supplier of porcelain clay to the United States. And two companies got the contract. One was Champion Spark Plugs, which if you remember a spark plug, it has a porcelain holder. And the other was Coors Porcelain. And that is kind of the history of Coors Tech. That's their humble beginnings. So anyway, I could give a whole talk on the mining history, but I know we're running out of time, so I will keep going. Just to say that interestingly, many of the formerly mined areas for quarries, clay, sand and gravel, etc., are now open space areas, which is a very interesting story unto itself. But that's all happened since about the mid-1970s. So there are parks, open space areas, et cetera. Some are, some are closed because of mining hazards, but it is various flavors of open space and people come here to enjoy that. And I, I'm one of those, I like it. So back to the near present. So, just to kind of 
I tried to put this together. It was really hard to draw these diagrams. What happened from about 65 million years to the present to carve out the golden landscape? And these were not very easy to put together. I made some very simplifying assumptions as to the structure. Um, but basically, I started with the idea that at 65 million years, the mountain fried was on Illinois Street. There was volcanoes putting lava down into the, the golden area. By 34 million years, between here and here, we actually have a whole section of sediment that's not represented by outcrop anymore. That's the 3,000 feet of sediment in the Denver Basin that's been stripped off. Um, we can reconstruct that from um, barrel history curves. So I put a bunch of sediment over Golden. Here's the volcanics for reference. They're buried. And that sediment probably lapped onto the front range somewhere. And you had, you had uh, basically around 34 million years, you didn't put any more sediment on there. You started to degrade the landscape with maybe meandering rivers and low uplands over here at the front range. You were still at sea level. So then I decided I better jump to 5 million years ago because I couldn't figure this out or how to draw it. So um, somewhere around 5 million years ago, you had a very low upland, which we now call the Front Range, and you probably had a stream that had, you had probably exhumed the top of the Table Mountains. It was still one continuous flow, but somewhere in here, Clear Creek, ancestral Clear Creek coming out of the Front Range, got locked into the Table Mountains. And once it got locked in, that was a huge change in the landscape evolution in Golden. Before that, um, rivers could just meander freely um, over the, the, the plains, what we'd call today the plains. But at the point of getting locked into the Table Mountains, once it became superimposed on that rock unit in paleotopography, um, that's what pretty much ca caused the golden landscape to start forming. And then, um, then certainly between the climate had already started glacial cycles in, in, you know, Miocene, but the Rockies weren't high enough to support glaciers until a certain time between five and say a million years ago, because um, they, they couldn't make ice. So that's kind of a, a a big key as to when that happened, and it's still somewhat of a mystery to me how that actually happened. Um, we know there's, in the Rockies in general, there's evidence for 12 separate episodes of glacial advance and retreats in the last two million years, but here in Golden, our best record is for the last half million years, okay? So, so if you look at Clear Creek, and what I did last winter was I went up on top of North Table Mountain and tried to envision what the upland looked like, say, a million to half million years ago. And, and you know, when you stand here on top of North Table and look to the west, it really is a rolling upland. Um, and, and if you look at the front range till you get to the crest, it's a, it's a, it's probably a hugely composite erosion surface. It used to be called the Eocene surface. I think that's, I've been informed that that's been abandoned. It's much more of a composite over since the Miocene. So you're looking at a low old surface. You do have a little bit of a relict valley here at the mouth of Clear Creek. And if you look at today's Clear Creek from North Table, here's what, here's what that lowland, that valley looks like. Again, without the topography, it's a little easier to imagine. But then the Clear Creek, Inner Gorge, as it's called, is about 600 feet deep, and it is steep. If you've ever driven up the canyon, it's very steep. So that's what it looks like on the, um, the west side of Golden Valley. And then on the east side, you can see the, the, inner, the inner gorge here, that's 600. Then it's 600 feet deep. It's 600 feet deep here in the um, My Coors Brewery. So it's basically all one valley and it's been carved pretty much synchronously through, um, through Golden. And it's taken, I'm guessing, around 500,000 years to cut that valley. Just, just, uh, just kind of something to consider. 
The other part of um, once Clear Creek got locked in and successively cut down is tributaries made these surfaces in Goldens. And that's what we were talking about at stop one. In Golden especially, you have what's called the Verdos surface, which is the oldest one in Golden, which is younger than the Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats is probably more than a million years old. It's actually an alluvial fan deposit. Um, Verdos is around the, um, oh, 675 to 410. Apparently in places, there's the Lava Creek ash in the base of the alluvium uh, associated with the Verdos surface. So that gives you kind of a maximum age to deal with. Um, and then below that, but and younger, so the oldest surfaces are high as the landscape degrades, and then the younger surfaces are lower, so that's the slocum, which is around 400 to 250,000 years. So you see these surfaces around Golden, they're pretty well preserved still, and that's kind of a fun function of how Clear Creek's tributaries were carving the Golan Valley while Clear Creek itself was incising from, from uh, west to east. So I promised I'd bring you back to Cafe 13. The younger alluviums, the Louviers, Broadways that are alluvium, that are more the, the glacial advances we can relate to um, in the Front Range, um, they actually deposit little remnants of alluvium and then the big plain off to the east in the Clear Creek Valley. That, that's the alluvial deposits of Clear Creek proper. And a quaternary geologist by the name of Vic Baker made a glacial flood estimate of Louvier's alluvium based on some um, cobbles and stuff out by Wheat Ridge along Clear Creek. And he pretty much got a, with his hydraulic um, calculations, he figured that the glacial floods needed to bring those sizes of cobbles down was around 50,000 cubic feet per second. So what I did is I plotted that on the, um, the stream gauge record of Clear Creek from about 1911 to present on the bottom here. Um, and there was actually a really large flood in Golden and along Bear Creek that the um, flood control districts estimate was um, in 1896 was about 8,600 cubic feet per second. So I've shown that on the far left, that would be the 1896 flood. And then um, the peak flows of Clear Creek since 1911, the highest was in 1933, around 5,800 CFS. So I just leave that to your imagination, what a 50,000 CFS discharge would look like coming down Clear Creek. Um, it's pretty huge. Um, but the cool thing is when you're taking a coffee at Cafe 13, look at the boulders and cobbles in the walls because those are the class that came down Clear Creek in those kinds of floods. And you get the ideas like, yeah, that was a pretty fast moving current. Because those are pretty much buildings. Those are boulders. And those are what was used to make the walls of the armory building. Something to think about next time you're having a coffee down there. And finally, and I'm not too far over time, that's going to bring us to our last virtual stop, which is I was hoping to reconvene at Golden City Brewery. Um, which is right downtown Golden, located on some of the alluvial deposits of the uh, Broadway Louviers age, and um, owned by a geologist, owned and run by a geologist. There was actually a Golden City Brewery in Golden in the 1870s, um, and then that name went away, and Charlie Sturdivant renewed that name, so that's where we would end. And let me take a look at some of the um, questions here. The Shoshanite flows. Uh, so, oh, I was going to say, I don't know if the Valmont dikes have Shoshanite in them, but um, that's kind of a rare composition, and I wish I was a better um, volcanologist to tell you about those, but those are, those are an interesting composition flow, and they're not that common, and certainly not common uh, from other parts of the Rockies. To my knowledge, I could be wrong, but I will just put that out there. So let's see. Oh yeah, Clark said, yeah, there's some very nice palm frond casts on the um, Bob Weimer Trail Stop 3 
So if you ever go there, that's another nice trail to follow. In fact, you should do the whole Bob Weimer Trail, not the upper part, because you go see the coal mine, uh, coal disaster monument and the clay pits and the whole, the whole thing. It's a good trip. Where would they acquire this? Okay, that was actually, there's another story about that. Of course, I have a million stories. Um, Paul, we Paul Heisman and I uh, figured this out that by going through the golden transcript, in fact, there's this amazing thing that's called Online Historic Newspapers of Colorado, and most of the newspapers in Colorado have been digitized from 1859 to the present, well, at least to the last, uh, not maybe the last 20 years, but, and they're all searchable by keyword search. It's an amazing resource. So we kind of figured out they were, um, there were dredges operating down by Clear Creek and McIntyre around 1905, dredge mining for gold. And you know, if dredging happens, they sort out all the cobbles and boulders and they leave behind these piles of rocks that are nicely sorted. And so the gentleman who designed the armory building in 1913 or so, um, he was going to use brick, but he found that taking those old cobbles and boulders off the tailings pile was a lot cheaper. And we, Paul and I both think that um, he may have used, um, because it was an armory building for the National Guard, it happened to be the Army Corps of Engineers, and all mine students were required to be in the Army Corps of Engineers. We kind of had the sneaking feeling that he used some free labor, and he had 3,000 wagon loads of cobbles that were used to build that thing. And we think that he probably engaged the, um, the engineering students to help him. So they came from just over by the Coors Brewery in the Alluvium uh, near Golden. That's where they came from. Yeah. So too much information. <laughs> Oh, so the oh, Camp George West, um, no, it wasn't the same architect because Camp George West, well, it's actually the same time, but they, um, they used um, the basalts off South Table Mountain. And that was uh, another army, that was the National Guard. Uh, Paul can correct me, I don't think that was the army, National Guard. Um, so basically they had a, a little different provenance. And uh, there's a rich history about Camp George West, too, and I won't drive you crazy with that. So, yeah, thanks all. I hope you guys enjoyed this. <laughs> there's like a million stories. And uh, one of the things I found with science communication that Alan Alda's book really stresses is to bring people to science, you need to have a story that engages people. Um, there has to be kind of a story you're telling. So I've tried to do that here um, as side stories, but when I talk to people who are in a geology audience, I start with the stories and I start with what you can actually see in the landscape. I don't walk them through the strat column. I don't start there at all. What can you see? And, and what's the story about it? And how do people relate to that? So, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs>